Okay. Now you test it out. Brother. <laughs> who represents the composite African, I call him the Imhotep of modern time. Because he was interested in economics. He was a very progressive person. In fact, he was a Marxist-Leninist. But luckily that Marxist-Leninist was overwhelmed by his Pan-Africanists. And so he combined the progressive understanding of Marxist-Leninism with the reality of trying to pull together something politically, and he had to do that through a Pan-African framework and reference. He was a Muslim by cultural foundation, but when he realized you need to unify a global people, and he, no one expressed that better than him, then culturally, he became our premier culturalist. And his great work is Civilization and Barbarism, which outlines this, but a previous work he did was the cultural unity of Africa. And that's what we have to understand. We may have differences in manifestations of our cultural, but there's a cultural unity, basic issues on how you look at life and how you uh, bond with your women, how you raise your children, and, and how you see creativity. Those are linked in Africa and unified, even though they may have distinctions and differences. So this awakening that we've had over the last 50 years is being continued by you this weekend. You're a continuation immediately of the 6th Pan-African Congress where W.E.B. Du Bois was there representing the U.S. Paul Robeson, Ross McConnell representing Guyana, C.L.R. James, Padmore representing the Caribbean, Kwame Nkrumah, Azikawe, Jomo Kenyatta, representing of the continent. And these brothers came together to put a meaningful vision for African peoples. And you need to understand why history is so important for us and why we've concentrated on it. Because whoever controls the history controls the vision. Let me say it again. Whoever controls the history controls the vision. You can't have a vision of African peoples as the global community we are, and as the mothers and fathers of humanity, if someone else controls your history. And that's what we have institutionalized, even at Morehouse and these other schools, where you have his story institutionalized, and not history, which is the unfolding of the human family on planet Earth. And if you put the unfolding of the human family on planet Earth in anybody's curriculum, Africa is at the center of that. History does not begin with Europeans, or who are raping and pillaging the world and rich white men with property and power. It begins with the Africans along their village, in their villages, along their uh, streams and their rivers and their lakes as they learn to live and love as family. The unfolding of humanity begins with us. And then as humanity unfolded, I call that African primacy, that whole process of African origin, African evolution, African cradle of civilization. Origin goes back millions of years. Now we got a problem because our Judeo-Christian, Islamic, greco roman Teutonic, Anglo-Saxon, white American tradition of knowledge wants us to start 6,000 years. I question that. 6,000 years ago, I question that. That may be in the biblical tradition, but we better go beyond that if we want to have an understanding of the human family. We go back 6 million years. The Creator started bringing forth Africans six million years. So you've got to redo and reconstruct all of this knowledge for the total reconstruction and reformation of the African peoples. And then as humankind evolved into large brain humanity, learning to live together spiritually and connecting and learning to create imagery and, and, and traditions that bonded people together in love and respect, that large brain human, humanity, that process, the evolution of humankind took place in Africa. So the origin is in Africa, the evolution in Africa, 200,000 years ago. And we don't have to worry about it. Science and history is on our side. White folks are discovering this every day. Your history is being exposed. But if you don't watch out, they'll take the scientific discoveries, they'll twist them around, they'll reinterpret them, and before you know it, you won't have the truth that is your truth. And the great truth is 
origin and evolution, and the climax is cradle of civilization. That's what the Up's legacy is. He left us that in his great book, Civilization of Barbarism. First 100 pages is African origin. He wasn't writing for you, that's why it's difficult. Don't start with the Up's first 100 pages. It was too difficult for me, and I was trying to translate it into French in Geneva when I went on sabbatical leave. He was speaking to scientists and beating those scientists back as he synthesized that material. The second 100 pages is his concept of evolution of society. Two cradles, one north and one south. Cradle of the sun, cradle of the ice. And the last 100 pages is Africa's contribution to science and philosophy. And there he gave us the cradle of civilization documentation. So you've got to plug yourself into an enormous growth of the human mind and experience to appreciate and understand these things. And you can't let people hold you behind. There's a brother there with your green coffee. Put your hand in the air, brother. Uh, don't turn around, I'm looking dead at you. And I ain't ludicrous. Put your hand in the air. Move when I move, and I'm grabbing my genitals. No, the brother was, was perplexed because he wanted to be here, he came, but he wanted to bring his partners, and his partners didn't see the significance of coming together. But I'm sure now, after the experience with us today, he'll be able to deal with those youngsters. But don't let them hold you back, brother. If, if Ludacris and 50 Cent and P. Diddy and Pooh Diddy and Funk Fiddy and whatnot <laughs> is their center, you've got to reinforce yourself with all of this fantastic explosion of information about African peoples so you can become a giant among your peers. <laughs> Economics, politics, and culture. We responded with an e a political agenda because the U AU had asked us to put in place a structure to help participate in their new construct of looking at the world's African community and coming up with a sixth region to complement the five regions uh, that uh, they traditionally had coming from the OAU, which was the initial organization that was formed. So we're trying to get ourselves ready to participate in this process. And so we touched on many things. Number one, our relationship with other people in the diaspora who will be relating to the OU's request of forming a sixth region. But Brother Menelik and Brother Smalls and others and those of us who were there understand that we may be responding to what they want from the top. But there's a historical response, there's a sacred response that we have to put in place from the bottom. If AU didn't exist, we have a responsibility of putting this in place. If the Pan-African movement didn't exist, we'd have to create one. And so we have a double process of responding to the request from the top and building a foundation at the bottom. And so we've got to talk about how do we take the key individuals and the key uh, of family units and the key organizations and the key institutions and weld them into a new Pan-African process. And just don't limit them to uh, ones doing economics and ones doing the politics and ones doing culture. See that as a continuity and, and a circle of power that we have to be building upon. And so that's where we're going. People were hesitant on what's happening. And when you have strategic peoples and organizations and ideas coming together, then you can come up with what we did come up with, agreeing on global citizenship throughout Africa for African peoples. Instead of this process of going to each African nation on your knees, asking them to be a part of what they know we have to do is to bond together. The wealth and technology and, and the understanding that African peoples have in the New World, particularly in, in these United States because we're in the belly of the beast, that understanding and wealth and technology has to be put in the hands of those who are responsible for the development of Mother Africa and Father Africa. And so we have to impose ourselves on Africa. We'll take as a temporary process citizenship in Ghana or even the right of abode, which is a trick and doesn't make any sense. But we'll take it as a first step, even though it's almost a step backwards. 
But our goal, our vision of what we need is a continental African citizenship for all those in the diaspora. And then when we did an analysis of what our wealth really is, and Museveni, who is an economist uh, at the conference we went to in, in October of 2004, Museveni did a breakdown of the economic disposable wealth of, of the African nations, and he, he came to a figure of $550 billion. Uh, a good part of it coming from South Africa with the gold and the diamonds and the precious metals, like $147 billion. Nigeria with oil, like $49 billion. Uh, Uganda with coffee and, and uh, cotton, $30 billion. Senegal with phosphate and peanuts, $24 billion. So that global African 53-nation disposable income is something like $5 hundred and fifty billion. Brother Small was in the middle of the auditorium. I was at one end of the end. The others, we, we started looking at each other. And we started doing an analysis. And we didn't say a word, but we all were thinking the same thing. The disposable income of the Negro in America is twice the disposable income of the whole African continent with all the diamonds and the golds and the uranium and the titanium and the vanadium and the manganese and the cobalt and the oil and the coltan and any other tans that they got in there. Because Africa is blessed to have these, this mineral wealth. So, but we now have an even greater responsibility. That means that we are misguided, vulgar consumers of garbage. Because that wealth is not a one-time deal. That wealth is a growing wealth. And a few years back, it was half a, half a trillion. Then it was three quarters of, uh, of a, a trillion. Now it's over a trillion dollars is our disposable income. And that's not our wealth. That's not counting pensions. That's not counting savings. That's not counting the values in your home. That's what we have to buy with. And I'm saying that we've got to learn how to turn that wealth around. And if we do it, we came up with a concept, which is a political economic concept, that the European, when it was destroyed on the devastation of European insanity, First World War I, then the Depression, then World War II, Europe trying to build out of those ashes, realized it had to recolonize Africa, and has been working at that ever since. But in order to help the Europeans get started, to jumpstart the Europeans, they came up with the Marshall Plan. African peoples, if they took just 5% of their disposable wealth, let me say that again, not 50%, I'm talking about 5% of their disposable wealth, they would have in hand a $50 billion Marshall Plan that could be put at the foot of Mother Africa. Just 10% of your wealth would be a hundred billion dollar development plan for Africa. That's larger than anything that the European could conceive of for his own development of his own people. Ten percent of our wealth, if properly used, and you can come up with a long-term plan that over the next ten years you're going to put ten percent every year. That's a trillion dollars you will be putting in Mother Africa. You can plan any type of development of, of industries, of universities, of technological cities, water systems, processing. All of that could be done in the, in the context of just 10% of the wealth that you waste. So we've got to understand where we are and what we've got to do. And so that's why I feel this so strongly. You see, Alambe is the expert when it comes to the revolutionary movements and liberation movements. But Dr. J is the expert when it comes to living on the ground in Africa. When I first went, most of you wasn't even born. That's 1961. And my wife was in a village in Nigeria in 1960. And then my village experience connected with her village experience and then some, something else happened there and we started going together in 62. And then 63, and then we got married in 64. I went to live in Africa two years. Before that time, we were in the Ivory Coast, and I did a, a, a travel around all of West Africa for that summer. The next summer, we were in Senegal, working in a village, a pilot village project of development. 
The next summer we're in the highlands of Guinea in Mamou with the PDG and the spirit of the Guinea Revolution. And I can still taste those youngsters in the uh, PDG, JDR, the youth wing of the PDG. And wherever they got together, they made their cry heard. New perfect home, la misère, dans la liberté, à l'opérance, dans la slavage. We prefer to live free in misery than in slavery in opulence. That's the spirit of the Guinea Revolution. They can't take it from Sidney Duray. That's the spirit. That's what Mommy Duray tapped into when he went to Guinea. And when you saw what they were doing and experimenting with reorganization of peoples and self-defense and everything else that was going on, it was a magnificent experiment that had to be destroyed. And those Portuguese invasions in 1970 came to destroy that which Guinea was experimenting with. And it was such a magnificent experiment that when we went to Mamu and they went up to Dalaba and they went to La Bay, we saw these youngsters in an educational system and with scientific men was being taught by 12-year-old kids to 7-year-old kids. And they had UN experts there to evaluate the experiments that were taking place in Guinea. Using traditional methods for raising agriculture, but using scientific methods as well. They had synthesized this in what they call the Cité Nouvelle, the new city. African village, but a global African village, using modern technology. That's what the experiment Secretary had, but when they invaded and they invaded and they invaded, the paranoia of not knowing who was around him kicked in. So who's been bored off? You don't know who's been messing with you. So when he went to China, which he never should have gone, he took 60 to 80 of his best people with him. So when the coup came, nobody was there. I was there, I had just left Nigeria and came into Ghana. And the coup came, nobody was there. And this was the most embarrassing moment for Pan-Africanists, for Africanists. Our great leader has lost his country, doing some mess that he should. He was a showboat. And all of us got that show thing in us. And he was going to Peking to eat in the people's palace at the great banquet hall, and then try to relate to, to Ho Chi Minh. But even Ma Si Tung couldn't relate to Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh had his own agenda for the liberation of his people. And there was no need for a couple to go there to try to be an intimate between Ho Chi Minh and his struggle for liberation. But because of that mistake, that calculated mistake, we lost him as the leadership of Ghana. It was a moment that devastated me because I was living in Africa at that time. But Sable Touré said, the brotherhood is a brotherhood. The love is love. It is unconditional and it is forever. And so in Kuma, in disgrace, moved through Europe. And then he was invited to come back home to Guinea. And because Nkuma did not speak French at the great stadium, Sekultori announced that you, Osajifo, Kwame Nkuma, are the new president of Guinea. And once they got together and figured out and Cuba's people figured out what had happened. They said, this can't be, we can't work. Let's work out a, a co-presidency. You had a dual presidency of Guinea. Do you understand how significant that is, that every black person should understand that sequence of events? That they took our greatest leader out, but his brother raised him up. And that's what we have to do. They're taking our leaders out, you got to raise them up. I wore a boat professor for four years. I'm here because my brothers raised me up. Brother Small organized the Sons of Back. We had organized the Sons of Back, but Brother Small put them into a paramilitary stage to protect me for four years. My brother's into heavy African martial arts, and he told his bosses in the New York State Drug and, and Rehab that I'm going to be leaving often to protect my brother, and he's there on the stage with me. When you see me at Harvard, he's there. When you see me at Columbia, he's there. When you see me at Mohouse in Sales Hall, he is there, ready to give his life for me. It's this brotherhood, sisterhood, familyhood that we're talking about. It's real Pan-Africanism. Yeah. 
Another analysis is going to hurt a few of you all, but it's going to be some clarity. We've got to systematize economics, politics, and culture into a pan-African system that will allow us to go into the 21st century to deal with other systems. The Asian system that has a Japanese dimension, a Korean dimension, an Indian dimension. Pretty soon we'll have an Indonesian dimension and certainly a Chinese dimension. We've got to have the African world prepared to deal with all of that. And our brothers on the continent are wide-eyed and bushy-tailed and don't know what's coming at them, just as they didn't know what the European was when the European came at them. We've been blessed to be in the belly of the beast to be able to see, know, and understand all of that which is happening on planet Earth, including science and technology. And we have to put that together to save and develop Mother Africa. Come on. The Chinese are in the Sudan when I was in Khartoum last year, and we went outside of Khartoum, a big complex, new, all lit up. The greatest medical center in that part of the world has been built by the Chinese. But the Chinese ain't interested in the health of the Africans, they're interested in the oil that is in the Sudan. Yeah. So we've got to have an understanding and give clarity to our people so that they can be prepared. Because we've got to organize a system to deal with all these other systems. Economics, politics, and culture speaks to our soul. South Africa. I went in 63 on sabbatical leave to Geneva to translate the Epps book for the program to combat racism. I'm trying to wind it up, Brother Money. And the program to combat racism helps the struggles in South Africa and other parts of Africa. And so I said I didn't think the churches were doing enough. So the head of the World Council Church, Churches, was, who was a partner, Professor Scobie, my partner, said, Dr. Jeffries, we want you to be the head of a task force to deliver more uh, aid to the struggle in South Africa. And we did, to uh, Adelaide Tambo and, and uh, all of the others that came through uh, Geneva, got them aid. We were setting up sewing circles, but they're really political education. A whole lot of other things was happening. But I had to put the Ups book on the shelf and focus on South Africa. And so I wrote a book, Crisis in South Africa. And an analysis of the control that they had they had complete and total control over the economics, the politics, and the culture. The culture key was education. They had a Bantu education that was controlling the minds of Africans so they couldn't liberate themselves, even if they wanted to. It was calculated, well-planned, using computers, etc. But out of this came a revolutionary path, came the light of victory, and it did not come from Alumbe's friends, the ANC. It did not come from Alumbe's friends, the PAC. The light of victory came from a brother leading his young troops called Steve Biko. And if we can't clock in the revolution of Sueto and those young people who formed the Black Consciousness Movement so they would not accept the brainwashing of the European Africana son of a so-and-so's, so when Nelson Mandela walked out of prison, it was not because of the strategic bombing of ANC, which said that we will bomb and not create death. It did not come out of the program of the PAC, which in great part was out of the country. It came out of these youngsters touching that key that if you can liberate your mind, you can have a true liberation. And these young children stood before the guns and their blood was shed. It is that blood that brought Nelson Mandela out of prison years later. It is that blood that woke up Winnie Mandela to be the mother of the struggle. And we cannot forget that. But we have to analyze South Africa in a hard way. South Africa is a plantation that is now being managed by black people. It is not a liberated zone. I'm going to leave you with that. It is not a liberated zone. When Nelson came out with a hand in the air and Winnie holding his hand with her hand in the air, they should have been yelling, Reparations now! 
There's no place on earth where reparations could not and should have been given because everything taken out of the ground in South Africa, every, every ounce of gold and all the diamonds are recorded in our computers. That and reparations had not been seriously raised in South Africa. If we can't put reparations on the agenda of our program, then we might as well call it quits. Yeah. Okay. So brothers and sisters, we're about the question of reparations, the question of political unification, the question of liberation, the question of, of, of self-development, the question of pulling our resources together and making it real. Let me leave you this one image and then I'm going to step into the wind. We started with the Black Madonna, we're going to end with the Black Madonna. You've got to control that history. Here's a woman that looks like our mothers, our wives, our sisters, our babies. This is Queen T or Ty of the Nile Valley sitting on the throne of Egypt, 1400 BC. She is truly the Black Madonna. The real Black Madonna. And let me just tie it together into a minute now. She speaks to what our work is all about. She was on the throne with her husband for 38 years when he built the greatest institutions of the Nile Valley, the Pettisson Waset University Temple. Thousands of people being educated in the African spiritual system. She arranged for Nefertiti to marry in the royal family. But when her husband died, she made the arrangement for her to marry her son, the Pharaoh Agnaten, who becomes a spiritual revolutionary. He moved out of Waset, Thebes, because of the corruption of the wealth that had been accumulating in the Nile. And he said, we need to purify and go out into the desert and build a new city of God. She sat on political power while he was allowed to do that. She held power for him. So she represents, for me, economics, Amen. politics, and culture. When he died, and he was deified because he's joined the Creator, she is one of the only women in history who had a deification process put in place while she lived because her role was so significant. This is an image of her that you usually have, but this is the image of us.